Namaste. So we're going to continue with Vedanta Sutra 114, which continues the line of discussion in the previous sutra that Brahman can be known only through the Vedic scriptures and not otherwise. So let's look at the sutra. Tat tu saman vayat, tat that, tu but, saman vayat, on account of agreement or harmony, or because it is the purpose. But that Brahman is to be known only from the scriptures and not independently by any other means is established because it is the main purport of all Vedanta texts. So looking at Shankaracharya's commentary, there's a lot of discussion and that discussion is centered around what is the actual purport? In other words, what is the actual purpose or aim of the Vedas? Is it simply to give instructions about sacrificial performances? In other words, is it only about action, karma kanda? Or is it principally to give knowledge of Brahman so that one can realize it? And this is called jnana kanda. So in this sutra, the question is resolved in favor of jnana, that the purpose of the Vedic scriptures is only to reveal Brahman. Now, I don't know if you've been following the discussion here, but in our community, uh, there is now a dissension uh, that whether Brahman can be known independently of the scriptures. And uh, this is, of course, not the, the point of view of the Vedas and not my point of view either, which is why I posted the video on Shastra Chakshush. But why is it? Why can Brahman never be discovered by a being who is incarnated in the material world? Well, the answer is very simple. We're all covered by Maya <laughs> in the form of upadis, the body and the mind. And whether we are Lord Brahma or an insignificant human being, we cannot pierce through that covering because it is endowed with the potency of Brahman. And we brought up the story of Lord Brahma, who is the first created being in the universe, and how he was born on the lotus flower in the midst of the causal ocean. And even though Brahma is millions of times more powerful, more intelligent, more long-lived than a human being, he could not figure out why he was there, what was going on, what his purpose is. But then he heard by, by grace the breathing of the Lord. And the breathing of the Lord was saying, ta pa, ta pa. Tapa means penance, sadhana. So Brahma began to do sadhana. And he sat in meditation for 10,000 years of the demigods, which is about 10 million or 100 million years in human time. And at the end of that, he became self-realized. 
he realized Brahman. And from that, he was able to derive everything else, all other knowledge. So he spoke this knowledge to his sons, Narada, the four Kumaras, and others. And they spread it by uh, oral reception, hearing, all over the universe. That's why the Vedas are called Shruti, Vedas and Upanishads or Shruti, because they are what is heard, beginning with Tapa, which is the practice that leads to enlightenment. Now, uh, Shankaracharya's commentary goes into great detail, elaborate detail, about how Brahman can never become the object of knowledge or action. So then what is the meaning of the Vedic texts if they are divided into karma kanda, dealing with action, and jnana kanda, dealing with knowledge? If Brahman cannot be uh, the object of either action or knowledge, how is it that they can help us to realize Brahman? Well, there are two things. First of all, the Vedas describe Brahman and the wonderful benefits that one gets upon realizing Brahman. Freedom from suffering, all embracing knowledge, freedom from fear, Freedom from birth and death, that's the biggie. Moksha, deliverance. This is the big prize. But if we never read the scriptures, we wouldn't know that it was there. Because Brahman can never become the object of knowledge. You cannot see Brahman. You cannot feel Brahman. You cannot know Brahman is there unless somebody tells you. Now, with Lord Brahma, all he needed was a little push, tapa. And he did what was necessary to realize Brahman because he has the intelligence. He's millions of times more intelligent than we are. After all, he creates the whole cosmic manifestation under the orders of the Lord and his Shakti. So Brahma is very powerful, very intelligent. And simply by hearing Tapa, he got it. But what did he get? The instructions of how to realize. And similarly, the scriptures cannot reveal Brahman directly, although they can talk about Brahman, Brahman's qualities, Brahman's functions, and so on, and especially the benefits of realizing Brahman. But most importantly, the Vedas give directions how to perform sadhana. And without these directions, nobody would ever guess. Nobody would ever figure out, especially a human being, which, you know, a human being is not very intelligent. None of us are. Unless we get transcendental knowledge, divya jnana, that is beyond ignorance, that is beyond temporary birth and death and sin and ignorance, corruption, and all the nonsense that goes on in the world. So that knowledge has to be available. And we see, for example, in the Western culture, Western culture is descended from Abraham. Abraham is the father of three great religions, Judaism, Christianity, 
and Islam in chronological order. And all of these religions are Abrahma. They are not in favor of Brahman. In other words, they're dualistic. They believe not in oneness or non-duality. They believe in duality. That duality is the basic fact of existence. So, as we can see from the world history, the Abrahamic religions have brought nothing but conflict and chaos and misery to the world. Whereas the Vedic culture, which is based on knowledge of Brahman, non-duality, united a vast array of different tribes into one great culture that has lasted for thousands of years without a break. How can it do that? Because knowledge of Brahman is the absolute truth. And that knowledge can only come from scriptures. It cannot come by any analysis of the material existence because material existence is duality. So some people theorize without any evidence that at some point long ago, some guy who we don't know anything about figured this all out and attained self-realization and told others about it and they attained and then gradually that knowledge came to be written down and that's where the Vedas came from. This is a, a anthropomorphic speculation that has no grounds whatsoever except in a stubborn refusal to accept the authority of the Vedas. What do the Vedas say about themselves? They say, well, Brahma heard the breathing of the Purusha. He followed the instructions and attained self-realization. And now this knowledge is being passed down to you. So if the Vedas are wrong about that, if that's simply a myth, that diminishes the value of everything else the Vedas have to say. Like if you meet somebody and they say, oh, I'm just a sweet, innocent farmer from uh, Oklahoma. And then later on, you find out where they were actually a big wig in Silicon Valley. Wouldn't that lead you to be very cautious about believing their bona fides? Sure would do that to me. Similarly, if we doubt that the Vedas are being truthful about their own origins, then we can doubt anything they say. And we can refuse to follow their instructions because of that doubt. This is exactly how religious cultures and spiritual organizations degenerate and fail in their purpose. For example, let's take Ramana Maharshi's teaching. Ramana Maharshi is undoubtedly or was undoubtedly a realized being. How do we know that? He displayed all the qualities of a realized being mentioned in the Vedas. So he was accepted as realized and then a whole teaching came about because of him. But immediately after he passed away, it began to degenerate. And we're on about the third generation now of teachers claiming succession from Ramana Maharshi, although he never nominated a successor. He never initiated anybody. <laughs> but anyway, we can see that with each generation, this teaching has degenerated further. 
Until now, it's basically just a business. Even the original Raman Ashramam is like that. Why? Because those who were entrusted with Ramana's teaching did not do the work necessary to base it firmly on the Vedas. And so their teaching, the quality of their teaching and the quality of the realizations that people get from it has very quickly diminished in only three generations. In another two or three centuries, nobody will have heard of Ramana Maharshi. But then you take someone like Chandrasekhar Indra Saraswati. Now, he's a whole different story because from the beginning, he was deeply uh, steeped in Vedic knowledge and connected with the Vedic literatures and taught on that platform his whole life. He never attempted to originate anything. He always, by word and deed, showed the highest example of a Vedic sage. And so his teaching will endure for maybe a thousand years, maybe more. Well, let's take the Buddha. Buddha is another example. As long as the Buddha and his teaching were considered part of the context of Vedic culture, it flourished. And if we read Buddha's lectures, his sermons, his suttas, we can see so many references to Vedas and Upanishads, even exact quotes. But about a thousand years after Buddha passed away, the Buddhist monks decided they had a better idea. And so they basically divorced Buddhism from the context of the Vedas. And then from that point, very quickly, the whole thing degenerated until now we have uh, the, the, the Church of Buddha, <laughs> which is no different in principle than Christianity. In other words, it's become dualism. I could go on and on. Another great example is the hippie movement. The hippie movement began in the 60s under the influence of psychedelics. Many, many people had their first taste of transcendence under the influence of psychedelics. I was one of them. But because they thought that was enough, in other words, they could continue to get support from the use of psychedelics, they didn't need any scripture. So they never cultivated Vedic knowledge. And now basically the whole thing has degenerated into simply a bunch of drug dealers and cultists. And the thing, the way you can tell a cult is that its scope is very narrow. Its teaching has very small uh, views and its boundaries are quite close and strong also. So now we see in the world a proliferation of innumerable cults based on the teachings of this leader or that leader. And they all have this one thing in common, that they do not fully accept the authority of the Vedas. And because of that, they don't last very long. One or two generations, they fade away, and nobody ever hears from them again. They may have been very famous at the time when they were founded, but then they become irrelevant quickly. Why? Because they're not based on the timeless teachings. They have no greater context than their own founder's realization. See, 
A good example of that is the Divine Life Mission, Vivekananda's organization, the Ramakrishna Order of Monks. They are very solidly based on Vedic knowledge. And they have very high standards for who they admit to their order. So this group will last, just like Chandrasekhar Andra Saraswati's group will last. But others will not. And that's because they have no context beyond the immediate teachings of their founders. And this is really the most powerful argument for complete acceptance of the Vedic literatures. Because by accepting them as the context for our work, we base our teachings on something that will last forever. And this is the most beneficial thing for all beings in the universe. Aung Tatsat, Aung Shakti Aung.